Welcome, good morning, everyone. Uh, bless you for tuning in. I really believe God's going to speak to us. God's going to help us. But before we uh, move on, we want to open up in prayer. Really want to believe God this morning, um, that God will speak to us, that God will help us. Let's bring our own cares and needs. If you're sick in your body, lay hands wherever the sickness is. Uh, let's believe God for a miracle. Let's believe God for healing this morning. Let's come before God. Let's lift our voices. Let's believe him. Father, we thank you, God, for your grace. Uh, we bless you this morning. We pray that your hand will be upon us. Uh, your presence uh, will be with us, Father. We pray for your touch. We pray, oh, Father God, for miracles. We speak healing, resurrection, life, oh, Lord Jesus. Oh, God, we command every infirmity to leave right now, Father. We believe you, God, for breakthroughs, Father. We pray, Lord Jesus, let our hearts be open to receive from you. Father, we thank you for all that you're going to do this morning. We bless you. And everybody said, amen. Praise God. We're meeting again on Wednesday at half past seven. Uh, you can join us in person or you can log on on Zoom. Uh, just email us. The email's down in the description box. Bless the Lord. In regards to giving, the information is going to come up. Uh, the scripture tells us that those who sow sparingly reap sparingly, and those who sow bountifully reap bountifully. Principle that God has put in the earth that as we be the supply lines to his kingdom, he will take care of us. Let's be faithful, let's be cheerful in our tithes and our offerings. Uh, as for the word of God this morning, let's turn our Bibles to Mark 6, verse 17 to 26. The scripture says this, For Herod himself had sent and laid hold of John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother's Philip's wife. For he had married her. Because John had said to Herod, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Therefore Herodias held it against him and wanted to kill him, but she could not. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just and holy man, and he protected him. And when he heard him, he did many things and heard him gladly. Then an opportune day came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a feast for his nobles, the high officers, and the chief men of Galilee. And when Herodias' daughter herself came in and danced it ple and pleased Herod and those who sat with him, the king said to the girl, ask me whatever you want and I will give it to you. He swore to her, whatever you ask me, I will give you up to half my kingdom. So she went out and said to her mother, what shall I ask? And she said, the head of John the Baptist. Immediately she came in with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was exceedingly sorry. Yet because of the oaths, and because of those who sat with him, he did not want to refuse her. I want to preach a sermon I've entitled Preach Preacher because that's a, actually a, <laughs> it's a little uh, a jab me and my friends used to use um, when any of us went on a rant. Any of us would get emotional and <laughs> going on with some long rant. We'll give you a certain amount of time, but after a while, we'll be like, Preach Preacher. <laughs> and all I did was to make you shut up. <laughs> I want to consider this morning. One of the all-time great preachers in the scriptures, and that is John the Baptist. Right now, he's actually my son's favorite personality in the Bible, simply because he was a great preacher. I'm teaching him about these people. Jesus said of John in Matthew 11, verse 9 to 11, says, But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I say to you, and more than a prophet. For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. Assuredly, I say to you, among those born of woman, there has not risen one greater than John the Baptist. But he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Jesus said that among those born of woman, there has not risen one greater than John the Baptist. When you consider his ministry, there was not many great signs and wonders that are recorded in the scripture. You don't read about John calling fire down from heaven or him doing miracles of healing or, or multiplying food or, or any of these kinds of things. What we know about John is that he was a voice in the wilderness. What we know about John is that he was a preacher. He never had a fancy building. 
He never had an amazing praise team. He never had an organ player right there with him. He had none of those things. He was just a voice crying out in the wilderness. He was a preacher. When it came to John, it wasn't so much about what you saw where he was. It was about what you heard that gripped him. John was a bit of an eccentric character. You know, he's dwelling in the wilderness. He dressed himself in animal skins. The Bible says he, he ate on wild locusts and honey. And so you got this eccentric personality, but it wasn't just, it wasn't him and his person, but it was the words that came out of his mouth that would captivate the crowd. John drew crowds to hear him preach in the wilderness. It is one thing to draw a crowd in a city or in a town, but here is John in a deserted place preaching. I can just imagine a shepherd passing by and hearing and watching John, and he's thinking, well, what is this man doing? Hey, well, what is he speaking about so passionately? And as he begins to listen to him, he's captivated by it. And he begins to, he's, he begins to be moved by the words that John is preaching. And then he would go and tell another one of his friends, hey, you need to come and hear this guy preach. And day after day, the crowd would have begun to grow and grow as more and more people would bring their family and their friends to hear the word of God preached. John was a preacher. I believe he preached with fire. Jeremiah said that God's word is like a fire shut up in his bones. I don't believe John was ever afraid or intimidated to preach the word of God. His message was repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. John called things the way they were. Matthew 3 and verse 7 says, but when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? That was one of those moments where people would have been in the crowd and suddenly they would have been like, yes, John, <laughs> give it to them. <laughs> this is the religious elite coming, but John isn't changing his message. John isn't watering things down. He's preaching the truth. He's Preaching the word of God. Let me tell you something. John wasn't an, was an, an imbalanced preacher. See, I don't know about this politically correct, uh, one-sided, palatable, limp-wristed, walking on eggshells, compromising popularity gospel. Oh, what a mouthful that was. I don't know about that kind of preaching. Where we, all, we never make any mention of sin. We never ever make any mention of, his, of God's holiness or, or even the severity or the judgment of God. Paul the apostle said in Acts 20 and verse 27, for I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Paul says, hey, if I'm going to tell you about his love and his mercy, I'm going to tell you also about his holiness and his judgment. I'm going to give you the whole counsel of God. See, John was a man that I could hear preach because when I listen to preaching, I need you to preach straight to me. I'm not one of those pious, self-righteous, sensitive types where I'm going to be easily offended. I need you to tell it to me straight. Don't dilute it. Don't put no additives to it. I, I don't need all the extra frills and spills. You don't have to dress it up or even try to entertain me. Just give me that raw, organic, unfiltered word of God. Tell me it straight. Tell me that Jesus Christ is the only way that no one comes to the Father except through him. Yeah, but I grew up in this religion. Yeah, but I come from this background. Yeah, but I have this other idea. Yeah, well, I think it doesn't matter what you think. This is what the word of God says. Tell me straight. Hey, if, the, if I love the world, then the love of the Father is not in me. Yeah, but you know, I'm just trying to be relevant and all of this. Hey, hey, if the love of the world, if you love the world, then the love of the Father is not in you. Tell me it straight. Tell me it straight. I cannot serve God and mammon. Who's my God? Do I live for money or do I live for God? Tell me it. Give me the truth. Tell me. No fornicator or sexual immoral will inherit the kingdom of God. Preach the truth to me because I understand 
This is serious business. This is life and death. This is eternity at stake. I am going to stand before God and I don't want to live a lie because I wasn't told the truth. Preach the truth to me. I'm not about playing religious game. One thing in church, another thing outside of church. I'm not about this lukewarm carnal Christianity having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. The scripture tells us in 2 Timothy 4 and verse 3, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine but according to their own desires because they have itching ears they will heap up for themselves Teachers, you know what the scripture is telling us? The scripture is saying there's going to come a time where people are not going to tolerate Bible preaching. The tolerance for it is waning in the last days. People don't want to hear truth from the word of God. People don't want you to preach the unadulterated, unfiltered gospel. People don't want to hear preaching like how John the Baptist would preach. Truth has fallen in the streets, the scripture says. Woe unto them where the time comes where people call good evil and evil good. We, we live in such a time. See, the scripture warns us in the last days there's going to be many false prophets. There's going to be many people declaring that they're speaking or that they're the mouthpiece of God, but they're false prophets. They're false prophets preachers. Uh, Matthew 24 and verse 11 says, then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. There will be many people who will start preaching what you want to hear. People who tick tickle your, your fancy, people who massage your ego, people who, who, are, who, are, um, who are there to prep you up, people who preach a you-centered gospel instead of a Christ-centered gospel. John the Baptist, my brothers and sisters, was not of that persuasion. He was the messenger that was sent beforehand. He was making a way. He was making Jesus' ways straight. His mandate was to, uh, to prepare the people so that they can receive uh, the Messiah. That, that's what good preaching is, is all about. Uh, see, when you went out to that wilderness to hear John preach, uh, you would get a word. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it feel like, uh, it feel like John had been watching you all week. You ever been in church? You see, I remember them days, man. You come to church and you're looking at your friend like, did you tell the preacher about me? Have you? Did you? Did <laughs> is this a setup? Like, what, what is this about? Hey, people came to John and he had a rhema word. He had a word that was in season, a word that was timely. Th those words where if you think where it feels like you're the only person who is sitting in the room. Jeremiah 23 and verse 29, it's not my word like a fire, says the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks the rock uh, in pieces. Uh, there's this old book by a man named James Black called The Mystery of Preaching. See, when it comes to the preaching of the gospel, I'm telling you right now, there's nothing uh, like it. Nothing grips the human soul like the preaching of the word. Hebrews 4 and verse 12 says, for the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the divisions of the soul and spirit and the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. See, what preaching does is preaching touches the inner man. That's what it does. When that rhema word goes forth, it demands a response from you. Whether good or bad. <laughs> Whether you humble yourself or you harden your heart. That's up to you. But preaching is going to demand a response. And depending on where you're at in your person will depend on the type of response you give to the word of God. Let me tell you something. As a preacher, I've been preaching, what, 12, 13 years right now. Uh, I've seen it all. You know, you stand in front of people over many years. You see, you see a lot of things. People, people actually don't think you see. But let me tell you something. 
I see. <laughs> uh, so you should be sweating right now. So you get different kind of responses to the word of God. You got Herodias' response. Look at verse 19. In the hearing of John's preaching, the scripture says, Therefore Herodias held it against him and wanted to kill him. Mm, this is not good. <laughs> but she could not. <laughs> Listen, man, I can, I, can, I can see how Herodias would have eyed John if looks can kill. Ah, uh, yeah, let me tell you something. Uh, I've, 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 I've had them kind of eyes on me before. <laughs> but hey, by the grace and mercy of God, touch not my prophets. <laughs> no, do no harm. Touch not my anointed, sorry, but do no harm to my prophets, man. The self-defense scripture of preachers. And so here's the reality. Her response to the word was she hardened her heart. It ruffled her feathers, it made her feel uncomfortable. She didn't like the truth of what John was saying, and so she she made herself uh, almost antagon antagonistic uh, towards it. Uh, she wanted to resist it. She wanted to silence it. She wants uh, John to be dead. The scripture speaks about the seed being the word of God in the parable of the sower, how it fell by the wayside. And what happens is the devil comes down like the birds of the air and he just he just eats it up. And many times this is what people do when they harden their hearts, when they, they stay they distract themselves, uh, you know, go surf the internet on, on their phone or whatever they're doing. When when they just start, you know, hold the baby, be distracted with this. I'm not interested in what you're saying, whatever it may be. People harden their hearts when they when they resist, they don't realize uh, that they're just making themselves vulnerable to the enemy in their life. And ultimately what we see with the heart and the heart, with Herodias' response is the word of God just has no effect on these people whatsoever. You also got the response that we see in John 6 of the multitude. John 6 and verse 66 says, from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Now, you have to maybe uh, in your own time read John chapter 6. This is just after Jesus had preached the sermon. And so he preaches a sermon to the people. The people didn't like what they hear. And so what happens? They walk away. You never see them anymore. I call such people one and done. You know, they just come, they hear a sermon. Okay, no, don't like that. That, that mess with me. <laughs> Never to be seen again. <laughs> Let me tell you something. When we first went online, there was all these people, man. All these people watching. <laughs> it's gone down. <laughs> people were like, yeah, well, that shows you you're not being successful online. Oh, or maybe it's the word of God. Sometimes people hear the word and they cannot endure. They don't want to apply it, so, so, so they walk away. There are others who are like a, a particular fellow in the scripture called Felix who would entertain and tolerate the preaching of the word. But they only do it because they have some ulterior motive. Look at Acts 24 verse 25 to 26. This is very interesting here. Look at this. Now he reasoned about righteousness. This is what Paul's preaching about. Self-control and the judgment to come. What a sermon series that is. Righteousness self-control, and the judgment to come. Felix was afraid. <laughs> this preacher's messing with Felix and answered, go away for now. When I have a more convenient time, Hey, when I have a more convenient, never make preaching something that only fits your convenience. But let me move on. That's a whole different sermon there. A convenient time, I will call for you. Verse 26, uh, meanwhile, he also hoped that money would be given to him by Paul, <laughs> that he might release him. Therefore, he sent for him more often and conversed for him, with him. Y do you see what's going on there? <laughs> Felix is like, I don't like your preaching, but because I want something, I'm going to keep coming back to hear it. Ah, <laughs> uh, listen, many people come or have all kind of motives for coming to church, man. And they'll put up with the preaching because many times... It's because I want something. It's because I've come to get something. Uh, I tell you, man, people, man, people are people. <laughs> what I want us to consider, though, in our text is Herod's response to the word. He's really where the sermon's at this morning. Herod's response to the word. Because you know what our text told us? Told us that Herod actually liked John's preaching. Herod is not like Herodias. 
Here it is, comes to church. She sits down. She screws up her face. She's like, no, no, don't like this. Don't agree. No, 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 no. Gets upset, and then she just she goes and browses the internet for the rest of the uh, uh, the service. Then, yeah, yeah, amen. And she walks out, and then she tells her husband, we're never going back there again. That's Herodias. You know, then you got the multitude who are like, yeah, okay, no, nah, mm, nah, this is not for me. And so they go, never come back again. Um, then you get um, the Felix types. You know, I don't really like this preaching, but, hey, Hopefully, there's a prospective spouse for me in this church, so I'm just going to stick around, right? And I only last for a certain amount of time. Anyway, Herod is not like any of them. Herod actually likes John's preaching. Herod is that guy who's in church every week, <laughs> shouting amen, <laughs> saying, preach, preacher. He's standing up at the good points. You guys don't know about this stuff. Man. He's standing up like... <clears throat> Oh, man, this, this, this here. He looking at people like, come on, man, this, this is good preaching. This is good preaching. And I remember this, this one time at conference, man. This is years and years ago. I remember this sister who was on this fr- at the front row. And when, I can't remember who was preaching, but when it was a good point, she'd be like, it's a message. She would shout loud. <laughs> it's a message. <laughs> hey, she's loving it. <clears throat> Herod is loving it. When, when John is preaching, when John is throwing down, Herod is there, it's hitting him. But man, he's like, ah, this is good stuff. Man, John preached that truth to me. Preached that fire. John is that guy who's bringing people. <laughs> John's like, nah, you, you, you. Herod's like, you need to hear this guy John preach, man. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. This be the good, this man preaches with fire. So James Herod bringing his, his guys, he's bringing his goons, he's bringing his people there, and they're there and they're sitting down, man. Some of them probably looking at Herod like, what's this all about? But Herod's there like, yeah, 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 yeah. He is into it. He loved it. And remember, John is still preaching that undiluted, unfiltered preacher. He is dealing with the situation. See, the problem with Herod is Herod loved the preaching of the word, but the problem was Herod wasn't living the word. There's no record in the scripture of Herod ever humbling himself or repenting. He liked to hear the word, but he didn't like to do the word. Herod was still in his sinful life. See, later on in our text, we read about his birthday. It's your birthday. (laughs) It's Herod's birthday. And Herodias, his daughter, is doing this dance for Herod. That the scripture says, please him and those who are around. This is something that is very sensual. This is something that is very erotic. This is something that is very perverse. Uh, You know, just... You, 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 yeah, your present day hip hop music video, okay? This is what's going down there. And he makes her this offer where he offers her up to half of his kingdom. For a man to offer a woman half of his kingdom, he's feeling that woman. Let me tell you that right now. Herod, now you got to consider this. Herod is lusting after his daughter in law. This is Herod. And this whole thing was a setup by his wife. You know why? Because she knew the kind of man Herod was. She says, yeah, you go down that, that, that church. Yeah, you log on online and you like listening to that, that John the Baptist. Yeah, okay. Yeah, you always there nodding and coming and telling me about his sermons and all that kind of stuff. But I know you. She knew him. And so she said, hey, she, she, you know, women are smart. They've got good intuition. She, she would have seen how Herod was, had been watching her daughter. She set this whole thing up. You know what our present to Herod is going to be? Is you're going to do, you, you, you're going to do that dance for him. And I'm telling you, he's going to offer you anything. And that's how we're going to get John. Because she knew what kind of man he was. Because Herod is a man who loved preaching, lapped it up, heard it gladly. Bible says he would even protect John. He loved this ministry. But it had no implication on how he lived his life. Exodus, I mean Ezekiel 33, verse 30 to 32 says this. As for you, son of man, 
the children of your people are talking about you beside the walls and in the doors of their houses, of the houses. And they speak to one another. Everyone saying to his brother, please come and hear what the word um, is that comes from the Lord. Hey, people are feeling the preaching. So they come to you as people do. They sit before you as my people and they hear your words. But they do not do them. For with their mouth they show much love. I mean there's amens, hallelujah, praise God, preach, preacher, come on. But their hearts pursue their own gain. Verse 32, indeed you are to them as a very lovely song of one who has a pleasant voice and can play well on an instrument. For they hear your words, but they do not do them. It is possible to love preaching. Hey, to be listening to all of these sermons. Some people will travel miles to hear um, their favorite preacher preach, but still be in the same old mess. Still be in the same problems. Still have the same issues, the same sin in their life because they love to hear the word. But they just do not do the word. God's telling Ezekiel, he says, man, they come before you. you. You like the way they come before you, Ezekiel? How they show you much love when you preach. You're like a, you're like a singer who plays a good instrument, who's got a great voice. He says, they hear you. But he says, Ezekiel, they ain't doing nothing. They're not applying the word. Something I had to learn as I've kind of grown in ministry is that a sermon is only as great as the response and the application of the hearers. It's not the analogies. It's not the stories. It's not the eloquence of speech. It's not the storytelling ability. It's not the revelation. It's not the style. It's not the being able to preach without no notes and all of that. These are delivery. These are all presentation factors. This, that's all about the craft of preaching. There was a time I believed that that's what made a great sermon. Hey, man, if, if I could some revelation in this ring, if I could preach a sermon with no notes, if I could, if I got the right stories and the right analogy, if I could present this uh, with a great eloquence uh, and all of these kind of things, then it would be a great sermon. And then people, people would change. No, 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 no. That's not what makes a great sermon. A, gra a sermon is only as great as the response and the application of his hearers. Because there's no point in preaching this amazing sermon and everybody goes home and carries on with the same old problems. What made Peter's sermon in Acts chapter 2 so great was that 3,000 people gave their hearts to Christ. <laughs> That's what made that sermon great. What made the, uh, uh, um, um, Jonah's sermon, which was, you know, by all means, a terrible sermon, but what made it one of the greatest sermons of all time is that a whole entire city came to salvation. Hey, man, my sermon's way better than that. Well, what happened? What's the fruit? He saw a whole city get saved. What makes the Sermon of the Mount, on the Mount so great is that it implicates our lives to this very day. So you may have a quote-unquote great sermon, but it doesn't always equate to a great outcome. Because many can hear with joy but bear no fruit of that very word. See, what preaching does, it, preaching draws people near to the kingdom. It draws people near to the kingdom. I, I, Agrippa said this to, to Apostle Paul. Apostle Paul's preaching to him. Then Agrippa said to Paul, Acts 26, verse 28, you almost persuade me to become a Christian. You know what he's saying? He said, hey, you could preach, you know. What you were saying there, hey, that was, that's fire, man. That made a lot of sense to me. So here he is right at the door of the kingdom. He says, you almost, you almost persuade me. Preaching draws you near to the kingdom, but you've got to make a choice to enter in and to respond. Otherwise, it's just cerebral. You're just gaining information and knowledge about the Bible and about God. That's it. So it just stays in the mind. 
something to, to, to think about, something to now know. And so we start to be a people who just, just want to know a new thing. So the scripture said that, you know, Paul went to Athens and there, there would be people who were gathered there just to c- come and hear a new thing. That, that, that was it. We become these, these sermon connoisseurs, you know, like the g- great expository preaching, brother. <laughs> the hermeneutics of your message uh, were, were, ex- were astounding. <laughs> yeah, come on. <laughs> this is what we become. Astute judges of sermon. Oh, that was a good sermon. That wasn't a good sermon. He's a good preacher. That person's a non-creature. But, but, but poor applicants of the word. There are things about Herod that just never changed. It plays out. Because the word began to implicate his life. And that's really where the problem begins. Because John touches a little nerve, touches a a button in Herod's life and says, hey, Herod, uh, you shouldn't be marrying your brother's wife, okay? And Herod is not happy with that that, that, that message. (laughs) And to appease his wife, he throws John in jail. He has him locked up. And we understand that later on, Herod is, his door asks for the head of John the Baptist. So you've got to consider this. To facilitate and to continue in his ways and in his sin, he cuts the word of God out of his life. It's ultimately what it is, because it's, it's going to come a lodge ahead. It's going gonna, it's gonna to come a time where it's like, if you're not living the word of God beyond the pulpit, beyond the context of a service, the truth of God's word is going to confront you. And you're going to have to make a decision. And the reality is, much as he loved the preaching of John, he wanted his sin. He wanted to go his own way. He wanted to do his own thing. He wanted to live his own, quote-unquote, Christianity. And so what happens is eventually he just turns John down. And what John's saying is, is no longer as potent. And before you know it, there is no voice of John anymore. Here's the sad thing here. A few years go by, and a man named Jesus Christ of Nazareth has been arrested. He's been brought before, before Pilate, and Pilate finds out that he um, comes, uh, originates from Galilee, which is in the north, which is under Herod's jurisdiction. Herod was in Jerusalem at this time. And so Pilate sends the Sahindran and Jesus over to Herod for Herod to deal with the situation because um, Pilate wants nothing to do with this. And so here is Jesus. Herod's heard about him. Herod, for the most part, believed that Jesus was John raised from the dead. He's heard many things. He's waited a long time to have an audience with Christ. And now Jesus is standing before him. Luke 23, verse 9 says this. Then he questioned him with many words. But he, speaking of Jesus, answered him nothing. Jesus didn't speak a word. Here is a man who cut the word of God out of his life to facilitate his lifestyle and his compromise. Now he stands before Jesus. He wants to hear from God, but God has nothing to say to him. That's pretty scary stuff right there. Jesus is like, hey, what's the point in me saying anything to you when the reality is you're just not going to do it? We keep playing around with this. We keep, man, I like it, but I'm still going to carry on in my sin. I'm still going to carry on my way. I'm not going to change. I'm not going to repent. I'm not going to humble myself. I'm not going to heed the word of God in my... It, it just gets to a point where it goes like, all right, cool. I won't say anything to you anymore. You can come and sit down and you go straight, straight over your head. Oh, yeah, it was good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's the sermon about? I have no idea. 
Oh, sorry. <laughs> I can't remember. This, Jesus comes before him. Jesus is not standing before him. He's actually standing before Christ. He said, I ain't going to say nothing. Because you're not going to do it anyway. Let's move on and look at the right response. The right response is to hear the word and do the word. To live the word. To do what is right before God. The Bible says that the word is a lamp to my feet. And so... What does the word say? What have we heard ministered? What have we heard preached? To forgive. So guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to forgive. To serve. Then I'm going to serve. To keep a right heart. Then I'm going to keep my heart right. To humble myself. Well, then I'm going to humble myself. We need to live his word. Let Preaching have its purpose in our lives, just as prayer should have its purpose in our lives. And, and reading the word and, and gathering the fellowship of the saints should have its purpose in our life. So should the preaching of the word of God. This isn't just a thing at, on, on the side, you know, this is Christianity and, you know, so I mean, you hear him, you know, what? No, 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 this, this is another important part and factor of our walk with God. Our responding to the preaching of the word. 2 Timothy 4 verse 2. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. I actually want to read the amplified version to you. This is Paul. Remember, he's writing to Timothy, who's a young pastor at the time. Preach the word as an official messenger. Be ready when the time is right and even when it is not. Keep your sense of urgency. Whether the opportunity seems favorable or unfavorable, whether convenient or inconvenient, whether welcome or unwelcome. Correct those who err in doctrine or behavior. Warn those who sin. Exhort and encourage those who are growing towards spiritual maturity with inexhaustible patience and faithful teaching now the text yes is written from an apostle to an to a pastor a preacher and so here is paul and he's instructing this pastor about his ministry of preaching many of us could read that scripture and be like well that's just for pastors no but you, you're missing it then because you gotta consider the importance that paul puts on this ministry because this ministry is to people there's an urgency and a potency in his instruction. He says, hey, Timothy, I don't care what's going on in your life. You be ready. <laughs> in feel like it, you don't feel like it. In season, out of season. You're busy, you're not busy. I don't care what's going on. You make sure you are ready to preach God's timely word at all times, whether it's convenient or inconvenient. So he's putting this importance on it. The reason why he's putting this on Timothy, because it's so important to the people. Because there's going to be times where we need correcting, where we need realigning. Come on, we naturally drift. <laughs> You know, we just drift, we drift, we drift, we drift, we just, we go somewhere else. Preaching many times, it aligns. Sometimes we need to, it's not, it's not, uh, well, I know this already. It's, am I living this? Am I living this? Need to realign. Need to realign. Hear a sermon on the Great Commission. Go preach the gospel, make this out. Yeah, I know that. Are you doing that? You have to ask yourself, when's the last time I told someone about Jesus? Where, where, who am I discipling right now? I need to realign. Many times we need correcting. We need warning. Come on, the flesh is real. Yes, it is. <laughs> and many times a word in season can save us from our foolishness. So some of you going funky. I don't know you watching stuff, you browsing stuff. I don't know what you I don't know what people are doing in their own time. But you know, you just you getting into a carnal state. Many times uh, what we need is that warning. That wakes or something real. Hey, hey, man. I needed to hear that in this time. 
And we also need to be encouraged and exhorted to fight the good fight, to not grow weary whilst doing good, to engage in the will and the purposes of God and the mission of Christ. All this, many times, is the need for any one person. Because the reality is, through different times and different seasons, one individual at times, yep, I'm doing great. Everything's doing great. Man, telling people about Jesus and all of that kind of stuff. And you hear a word that just encourages you and exhorts you and strengthens you in what you're doing. So you can continue to grow and continue to be fruitful. But then seasons change and next week you're struggling. <laughs> and you're doing all your acting, you're thinking all these crazy stuff, man. And you're looking places and you, you want to do things and your flesh is raging and all that kind of And you need a warning <laughs> of the reality of sin. It's like, hey, man, that kind of thing. And sometimes it is. We need correcting. We've gone funky or we're... we're, 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 we're we're going slightly off course of things and we just need to realize I'm talking in the in the life of any one Christian we need all these things and that's why Paul is telling his son in the faith Timothy man he says you preach that word you preach the word be ready son to convince to rebuke to exhort with all long suffering and teaching he says and that's the reality of preaching it's, it's not just with all long suffering it's not just the one sermon it's, it's that continual ministry, consistent ministry of the word of God. What we got to make sure as the saints is that we're not only hearing this word, but we have a heart to receive it and to live it out in our lives. The title of my sermon was Preach, Preacher. I'm going to preach. I'll tell you that right now. I'll preach, Preacher. <laughs> The question is, will we as the saints hear and apply his word so it can bear its fruit in our lives? Let's bow our heads. Let's close our eyes in respect to God, the person next to you. We're going to take a few moments to pray this morning. Maybe you're, you're watching this morning and you're not right with God. Jesus Christ is not Lord. He's not Savior over your life. I tell you that he loves you. He died on the cross for your sins. Pay the ultimate price so you can be free. Preaching brings you near the kingdom of God. You're going to make a decision whether you're going to enter, whether you're going to make Jesus Christ Lord, whether you're going to turn away from sin, or you're going to be like Herodias and harden your heart. Are you going to switch this off, go away, and just continue on like the multitude in your own way? Or are you going to humble yourself and say, Lord, I need salvation. I don't want this life of sin anymore. I want you to, I want your forgiveness. I want your grace. I want to lead you in a quick prayer. Maybe you're back sitting. You want to rededicate your life. Pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I believe that you came and died on the cross for my sin. Right now, I turn away from sin. And I receive you into my life. I put my faith and trust in you. Thank you for your salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that, please get in contact to what, with us. Our email is... Um, it's down in the description box. You say, hey, I pray today. Uh, what do I do next? And uh, we try and get you a Bible. And uh, we'll be praying for you and, um, and, and continue to tune in. Just for the saints, this is the reality. We hear a lot of sermons throughout our, our Christianity. And sometimes it could be something where, you know, uh, we get too much of a good thing. It just gets familiar. And you start to be contemptuous towards it. And it's like... Another sermon, another word. Oh, yeah, is this, oh, the sermon's uploaded? Oh, okay. Yeah, I'll listen to it later. Yeah, yeah when I get some time. Uh, i get five minutes in here. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Hey, listen. I have no idea how people watch sermons and how you're listening to sermons and all of that stuff. Hey, it, it, it's, it's, it's nothing on me. Paul writes to Timothy, and he's saying, you need to do this. It's for the people. It's for the people. Just how prayer, just how reading the word, just how the gathering, just how worship are important factors for your spiritual health. So is your receiving an application of the preaching of the word of God. All I see in our text that Herod, though he enjoyed it, ultimately came a point where he started to be, he held it in contempt and he didn't apply it. And eventually he cut it out from his life. He's standing before Jesus later on. God has nothing to say to him. We, we read the word of God. We've got to heed. 
And we're going to say, Lord, I want an open heart. I want you to be, I want to hear God speak to me through the word of God, the preaching of the word. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning. Oh God, we humble ourselves before you. That we would have hearts that would be open. We would have ears to hear your word and we would live it. We would live it. It would be our foundation. Father, we thank you. We thank you for the truth of your word. And we pray, Lord Jesus, that it would bear its fruit. We'd be like that good soil. That when the seed which represents the word is sown into it, it bears its fruit. Some 30, some 60, some 100. Father, let our hearts, our hearts be open that you can speak to us. We bless you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Bless. Have a good, good, good Sunday. Amen.